So what does Ephesians 5.18 mean when it says, do not get drunk with wine for that's dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit? I am excited to try to talk about this this morning. I could try to be cute and give this a title like Spirit-Filled Moms or something, uh, but this is for all of us. This is part of our series on the sins of control. Uh, but I'm not really going to press that connection this morning. Obviously, there is a direct connection since the verse starts with, don't get drunk with wine. Um, but I, I, I don't think I need to press it for it to be clear. I want us to emphasize that our goal is to understand what Paul means here in this phrase, w- with this phrase in this letter. I think it's tempting to find some other places in the Bible that refer to being filled with the Spirit and to assume that they can explain what Paul means here. For example, do you remember that workers on the Old Testament tabernacle were filled with the Spirit so they would know how to do what they didn't know how to do? To make the things that God had uh, appointed for the tabernacle. Elizabeth and Zacharias were momentarily filled with the Spirit around the time of the births of Jesus and John. The gathered disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit in those moments when he stood before the Sanhedrin at his trial in Acts chapter 4. But we we need to be slow about assuming that Ephesians 5.18 is talking about those same things. And let me just mention a couple reasons why. First of all, Paul was writing at a different time, not describing the Old Covenant tabernacle construction, not talking about the day of Pentecost or those early days when the Spirit was testifying together with the apostles and prophets. He's writing a couple of decades later with exhortations for Christians who live in Ephesus, modern-day Turkey. He's writing much more into our setting. Another reason to be slow to draw the parallel there is that he was writing in a different situation, not building the tabernacle, not the birth of Jesus, not the day of Pentecost. He was writing to the Ephesians about regular Christian living. And then finally, what Paul says here in Ephesians 5.18 uses unique grammar and vocabulary. There is no parallel to this anywhere in the New Testament. This statement stands uniquely. So for all those reasons, what we want to ask is, what does Paul mean here with this phrase in this letter, and I think for any person who's been born again, you say, I want to know, what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? So let's make an attempt at answering that this morning. Let's pray. Father, would you give the grace of your Spirit to us this morning? We believe that you have already given the Spirit. He is a gift we have received as a down payment guaranteeing our inheritance. So we believe we have the Spirit, but we want to understand what it means to be filled with the Spirit. And we need you. These things are spiritually understood. No amount of rhetorical ability or reasoning can bring us to understanding of things that you have revealed by your Spirit. So help us today. And Lord, help us because you care for us Help us because you shepherd us and you're a father who's kind and tender. And as our father, we know you care for us when we are in the trouble of not being filled with the spirit. The dissipation that leads to wild and reckless living without thought of consequences. So we're asking you to work in our heart this morning, partly because we need you to rescue us from ourselves. So give us that heart of teachableness and humility before you. And might you as our kind father and good shepherd guide us today. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, the best way to answer the question, what does Paul mean here with this phrase in this letter is to stay in Ephesians and look at this letter. So that's what I'm gonna focus on almost exclusively this morning. And though it might seem a little bit out of order, I want to begin by asking, what are the results of this filling of the Spirit? What are the results? If this happens to you, what will it look like? What will the results be? And let's try to answer that from the book of Ephesians. What happens when the Spirit is at work? What is Paul's vision for this vibrant Christianity? You see on your handout, this is summarized with two big headings. First of all, 
your new life will be spiritually understood when you are filled with the Spirit. You were born again by the Spirit. He brought you to life. And so the work of the Spirit is all about the new life. Everything we're going to say this morning connects to that idea of the new life. Paul says in Ephesians that before you were born again, your understanding was darkened. Your mind was futile. You were ignorant. You see, that's why you see here, your new life will be spiritually understood. These are things that your unsaved mind could not grasp and could not understand. And that's why Paul uses words like wisdom, revelation, understanding, comprehension, knowledge. Those are things that the Spirit does to help you understand the new life that you have in Christ. So let's summarize that with five subheadings. So first of all, to understand the new life, you have to see the old life clearly. Look at Ephesians 2 verse 1. And we'll be reading lots of sections of Ephesians together this morning, so you'll want to have your Bible ready. Ephesians 2 verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Remember that last Sunday we talked about verse 2 and how the believer has the Spirit of God in him, but the unbeliever is influenced by the Spirit that's now working in the sons of disobedience. Everybody's under the influence, either of the Spirit of this world or the Spirit of God. The old way was a deadly way, just indulging yourself however felt good, enslaved to your desires and to Satan's influence, making yourself a child of wrath, excluded from the life of God. In Ephesians 5.18, that word dissipation, which we don't really use in English, but there's no one English word that captures it, talks about a wild and undisciplined life with no thought for the consequences. Instead of getting drunk so that you lead a wild, reckless, destructive life, be filled with the Spirit. So the point is this. A person who is filled with the Spirit doesn't look at the old life and say, oh, I wish I could be a slave to sin and Satan again. That'd be great. Do you remember when Israel did that? When they came out, God brought them out of Egypt by this great redemption. And they're being fed by manna in the wilderness. And they say to Moses, what are we doing out here in the desert? And we are sick of manna. We had the good stuff in Egypt, like fish and leeks and garlic. Some of you maybe amen that, I don't know. Let's go back to slavery in, England, in, in Egypt and get some more garlic. England, <laughs> Egypt. <laughs> All right. I told some of you yesterday, my wife and I are headed on our anniversary trip today, so vacation begins today. So please understand that in this sermon, vacation might already be seeping in <laughs> and affecting my ability. Let's go back to Egypt, they said. Slavery was great. Now, I don't think that when they were in slavery, that's what they said. As a matter of fact, God had heard their agonizing cries from that bondage and rescued them. And then they said, we're tired of manna. Let's go back to leeks and garlic. When you're filled with the Spirit, you don't think that way. You don't look back at the old life and say, oh, that was good. I want to go back there. You see it clearly. You look back on it with grief and really with fear that you would go back to that kind of slavery to sin and self and dissipation, wild, reckless, living without thought for the consequences. Secondly, as part of spiritually understanding the new life, the Spirit enables you to be grasping Christ's love deeply. Ephesians 3 verse 14. 3 14. For this reason... I bow my knees before the Father. So Paul prays, the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit 
in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ. All right, that all goes together in one big long breath, leading to the big climactic peak at the love of Christ. The Spirit strengthens you with power in the inner man so that you can grasp, grab a hold of the love of Christ because the love of Christ surpasses knowledge. Now that might mean that it's beyond what you can understand as an unsaved person without the Spirit, but it also may mean that it's so wonderful that there's always more for you to know and understand about Christ's love for you. If you think you understand Christ's love for you, be certain there is more. There is more to know. There is more to rest in. There is more to understand. And when a person is filled with the Holy Spirit, they will be growing in their understanding of Christ's love for them. And what Paul says in verse 17, 317, is that that roots you and grounds you. I think we could argue that nothing is more important in the life of a Christian than a spiritual understanding of Christ's love for you. Because I think if you take anything else that we could say is important in the life of a Christian, it comes out of a spiritual understanding of Christ's love for you. Like obedience. What motivates obedience? His love for you, right? And so you want to obey him in return. What motivates you to share the gospel with somebody else? His love for you, and you you want other people to know about that. And out of love for him, you want other people to love him. What compels you to be a humble servant to other people? What strengthens you in deep suffering when everything else is gone? What's the last bottom part of the rope that you're just barely hanging on to? He loves me. He loves me. Being filled with the Spirit means being filled with an understanding of Christ's love for you since you've been born again to a new life. Another part of this spiritual understanding of the new life is recognizing your privileges fully. Back in chapter 1, beginning in verse 15, For this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you and your love for all the saints, I don't cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. What's he praying? Verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. A spirit of wisdom and revelation. Surely he must be referring to the work of the Holy Spirit. You've got Father, Son, and Holy Spirit right there in that verse. Who else is the source of wisdom and revelation for you? So what does the Spirit do? He is a source of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ. If you remember our study of John 14, 15, 16, 17, that's just what we expect. The Spirit comes to reveal the truth about Jesus. So keep going in verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. So this is still a work of the Spirit, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and dominion and authority and power, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet. All right, we'll pause there. So what does the Spirit do? He's a source of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ. He helps you get Jesus. Understand Jesus. And when you grasp Jesus, see, the way it says it at the end of verse 17 is, a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And we might think that just means knowledge about Jesus. But Paul goes on to say it's more than that. It's not just knowing about Jesus. So of course that's true. But it's understanding all that you have in Jesus. All the riches that are yours. So that's why he goes on to say the Spirit opens your spiritual eyes up so that you know the hope of Christ's calling of you, the riches of the glory of Christ's inheritance, because that's your inheritance too, the surpassing greatness of Christ's resurrection power in your life. In other words, When you are filled with the Spirit, you are not a grumbler because you feel rich. 
no matter what your circumstances are from an earthly perspective, you have this new life that is full of these new privileges and you just feel so rich and you just feel so unworthy of being so rich because you know you're a sinner and you're thinking, what was God doing when he gave me all this in Christ? And the grumpy grumbliness that so takes over our hearts sometimes flees away when you're filled with the Spirit because you just see your privileges in Christ and you just go, wow, I'm so rich. Whatever happens in this life. And then a fourth part of this spiritual understanding of the new life is that you go back to your created purpose humbly. Look in Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, 23 and 24. That you, that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. In verse 24, put on the new self which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. It's hard for the translations to figure out what to do there in verse 24, but what it says is that your new life, your new self in Christ, has been created according to God. Your new life has been created according to God. Now, what does that mean? I think the best answer is to just go ahead a few verses to Ephesians 5.1 where it says, therefore be imitators of God. Now that phrase ought to make you go, woo! What is that? Be imitators of God. It doesn't say be gods. That's different. <laughs> but be imitators of God. Now the idea in both of these verses takes us back to creation did you see that he uses that language in chapter 4, verse 24? Has been created. This is like a new creation, like a second creation. So he's taking you back to the original creation when God created man, how? In his image, right? Created man to be, reflect God's character on earth. Then sin messed that up terribly. But when the Spirit causes you to be born again, when you receive new life in Christ, it's like you go back to your created purpose. Now, once again, as this new creation in Christ, you have this goal to reflect God's character on earth, to be imitators of God. Wow. At National Day of Prayer service Thursday night, one of the pastors prayed something, just a very simple little line, but boy, it grabbed my attention because I was thinking about this. He prayed that we would line up our thoughts with God's thoughts, our words with his words, our actions with his actions. Isn't that good? Be imitators of God. Line up your thoughts with his thoughts, your words with his words, your actions with his actions. That's just what Paul is saying here. And this was your created purpose, to line up your thoughts and words and actions with those of God so that you would be a reflection of him here on earth. When you are filled with the Spirit, you will desire to be an imitator of God, to line up your life with Christ. Can you see how different that is from a life lived for whatever I feel like might make me feel good today? Such a huge change to say, now I've got a purpose to live for. I've got a new life, something more than just me, 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 and what I want today and what I'm grumpy about because I didn't get today and what I wish I could have today and whether people are doing wrong in my life today. At the same time, I use the word humbly there, partly because I grew up in Utah. <laughs> Um, being an imitator of God will not give you, give you any delusions that you are God. That's what I mean. You'll remember that you're just creation, that you're a rescued rebel, that this whole deal is a great privilege. But you'll still take up your created purpose and you'll say, I'm supposed to be an imitator of God recreated in his image. I know we're not to this point in the sermon yet, but this is so immensely practical. Can I talk to our kids that are here for just a minute? Our young people, our teenagers? You know when you're at home 
where you're most comfortable and you probably have the hardest time with your behavior and words are coming out of your mouth toward mom and dad or brothers and sisters or whatever that you wouldn't say here at church in front of Pastor Tim? You'd be embarrassed for me to hear you say those things? Do you know that part of what you're missing is that you're a new creation in Christ and you've got this purpose from God to live in his image. Would God talk like that? Like what you're saying to your parents? Would God treat your brothers and sisters like that? Are those the kind of words that come out of his mouth, that kind of anger, that kind of bitterness, that kind of meanness? See, you need spiritual understanding of who you are in Christ. You need spiritual understanding that there is more to life than what you feel like you want today. God has bigger purposes for you. He wants you to be an imitator of God. Then finally, spiritually understanding the new life means owning your calling personally. Look at chapter 5, verse 8. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Well, actually, go back to chapter 2 first. Chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Wow. Walk in a manner worthy of your calling. He said in chapter 1, it's Christ's calling of you that gives you hope. Walk worthy of the calling. That doesn't mean you can make yourself worthy to be called, right? That's not the same thing. Christ did not call you because you're worthy. You're, ne you're never going to be worthy of God's forgiveness and love. But when God sacrifices his own son to rescue us from the destruction of the old life, and when God causes us to be born again with new life, and when God calls us now to live a new kind of life, and he takes us back to our creative purpose to live in his image, you need to personally own that calling. You need to say, that's me. This is God's calling for me. He created me in Christ Jesus for good works. He called me away from a life out of control, and he called me to a new kind of life. It's when the creator calls you to his family, you pay attention to his family and how to live in that family. When the king rescues you from slavery to darkness and he places you in his new kingdom, you should walk worthy of that calling and that new kingdom. Look at Ephesians 5 verse 10. Ephesians 5.10, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And look at verse 15. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise. In verse 17, so then don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do you see how those things lead us right to Ephesians 5.18? So Ephesians 5.18 fits right into this theme of your calling your personal calling to a new kind of life. When you are filled with the Spirit, you will own that calling personally. Okay, so what we've seen here is that being filled with the Spirit results in spiritual understanding of your new life in Christ. You see your old life clearly. You grasp Christ's love deeply. You recognize your privileges fully. You go back to your creative purpose humbly and you own your calling personally. Now, I, as I say those things, as I wrote this sermon, I felt like uh, it just doesn't have the same power when I say it as if you could just read through it in Ephesians. So I just encourage you to take Ephesians and read through it after this sermon this morning. But when Paul speaks about being filled with the Spirit, as it has so much to do with the spiritual understanding, he takes it so much further than that. The spiritual understanding is foundational, but to me, it's almost stunning how practical Paul insists these things must be. Your new life in Christ is not just something theoretical, but something that must be put into practice right in the middle of real life. 
Okay, so for our second main point about the results of being filled with the Spirit, the result is that your new life will be put into action in real life. Easiest place to see this is Ephesians 5. Start in verse 18. Don't get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making a melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. Be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Chapter 6, verse 1, children, Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Chapter 6, verse 4. Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters. Chapter 6, verse 9. Masters, do the same thing to them. Give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven. There's no partiality with him. Does Paul know how to get practical? And that all flows out of be filled with the Spirit. That's just not Paul going on to other things. That all comes out of be filled with the Spirit. And so be filled with the Spirit might sound distant, abstract, theoretical. Paul says it doesn't get any more practical than this. We see something similar back at the end of chapter 4. In chapter 4, verse 30, Paul says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And in chapter 5, verse 1, be imitators of God. Those are big, grand themes, right? Don't grieve the Spirit. Be an imitator of God. Somebody could say, what does that mean? Well, look at the context. Chapter 4, verse 25. Stop lying. (laughs) Verse 26. Don't let the sun go down in your anger. Verse 28. Stop stealing. Work hard so that you can give to other people. Verse 29. Don't say anything if it's not going to build up somebody else. Verse 31, get rid of all your bitterness and slander and malice. Verse 32, start being kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving. That's the kind of stuff Paul says in the context of don't grieve the Spirit and be an imitator of God. You see something similar at the beginning of chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 1, walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Again, that sounds grand. So what does he say in verse 2? Be humble and gentle and patient, tolerant with one another. (laughs) That's what it looks like. So clearly being filled with the Spirit results in the new life in action in real life. All right. Three areas of focus for that. First of all, your new family. Your new family. The, The new life in action in real life starts with your new family. If you look at Ephesians and all of Paul's writings, you'll see that when Paul wants to apply the gospel and make it really practical, he starts by applying it to our relationship with our local church. We were just looking at the beginning of chapter four, right? Verse one, walk worthy of the calling with which you've been called. Verse two, be humble, gentle, patient, showing tolerance. Now you might think, well, that applies to everybody, right? Paul's talking about how you relate to anybody else. Well, that's true, but that's not what he means. Because look at Ephesians 4, verse 3. Being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So where does Paul say we ought to have humility and gentleness and patience and tolerance? Right here. Right here in the body of Christ. That's where the new life springs into action first. He's calling you to fight for the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Because Ephesians 4 verse 4, there is one body and one Spirit. You are not united together by one Spirit who has been given to all of you as your down payment of your inheritance. And so when he says, like down in chapter 4 verse 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, he's still talking to the church. When you're filled with the Spirit, you put your new life into action with your new family in Christ. This is also the emphasis in the big section of of Ephesians that gets ignored all the time. Ephesians 2, verse 11, through chapter 3, verse 13. I think you've heard me refer to this before as the black hole in Ephesians. There's one, a couple little verses in here that we quote, but by and large, we just ignore this whole section. And 
We love Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, right? There's probably no more beloved gospel passage. But then we get confused when we get to Ephesians 2, 11, and Paul says, therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, and at that point were lost. I don't know what the uncircumcision Gentile thing is, but it doesn't sound relevant. It doesn't maybe fit our practical everyday agenda. It doesn't seem like something that hits home for us. But maybe that's because God cares about the unity of the church more than we do. Maybe we need to care about the unity of the church more. Because what God's talking about here is how, what Paul's talking about is how God brings together Jew and Gentile, breaking down all the division between them and bringing them together into one body. And so he says that, he explains all that, and then he says, so I implore you to be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace at the beginning of chapter 4. That comes out of this whole Jew-Gentile discussion. How about if I, th- though this isn't in complete, this isn't fully what Paul's talking about, how about if we use a word that maybe does seem relevant? Paul's talking about racism. That's not all that he's talking about because there's also Old Covenant history and the Gentiles grafted in, and I know there's more to it than that. But Paul's talking about the kind of things that drive people apart and how God and the gospel brings people together in unity. So the filling of the Spirit brings the church together. Look at this also in chapter 5 in our text, chapter 5, verse 18. When he says, be filled with the Spirit, he immediately follows that up with a series of verbs that grammatically are underneath be filled with the Spirit. They're like subpoints, you could say. Be filled with the Spirit. What does that mean? What does that look like? It looks like what's the very first thing he says in verse 19. Speaking to each other in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. The very first application of being filled with the Spirit is the way you sing truth to each other in your church family. And what's the second application? The way you give thanks to God together in your church family. People filled with the Spirit get together and praise the Lord, and they love it. What's the third application? Verse 21, Ephesians 5, 21. Be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. He's talking about the church family, a church family where everybody is submitting themselves to one another. What do you need? How can I help you? How can I serve you? What's best for you? So when you are filled with the Spirit, you will love the church and you will fight to be a properly working part of the church and you will be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit. Okay, so when we put the new life into action in real life, our first focus is our new family in the church. The second area of focus starts in Ephesians 5.22, right? Wives, husbands, children, fathers, slaves, Masters, here are some of our closest or our hardest earthly relationships. Your new life is supposed to be put into action at home where it matters most. The filling of the Spirit is supposed to transform marriages and challenge the tendencies of children and strengthen struggling fathers and even reach down into the complicated relationships of first century Roman slavery with Christian slaves and masters. The gospel's supposed to go there. You see how Paul's not afraid to go anywhere practical? (laughs) He's not afraid to step into any area of our lives, including the most difficult relationships or the most closest relationships to us. And there he says, this is where the filling of the Spirit's going to change things. And then the third area of focus for the new life is your relationship to the world of the old life. See chapter 5, verse 3. Immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Or back in chapter 4, we have a narrator ready to help me out if my voice runs out. This is cell phone morning at GBC, huh? All right, Ephesians 4.22, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. And then look at chapter 4, verse 17. 
So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk. Can you see the theme in all those passages? I think we could say it this way. Your new life is not an addition to your old life. It's a replacement for your old life. And when you are filled with the Spirit, your new life will change your relationship with the world and with your old life. Okay, so we've reached the end of the bulk of the sermon, which is about the results of the filling of the Spirit. And that's so vital because when, when we say the phrase, filled with the Spirit, Christians might picture or think of all sorts of different things. But what Paul intends for you to think of here in Ephesians is that the Spirit gave you new life. And when you're filled with the Spirit, he helps you really understand that new life and it gets put into action in every part of your life. That's what being filled with the Spirit looks like. All right, now we can answer the question, what does filled with the Spirit mean in this verse? And again, it's important for us to say in this verse because there are some other fillings with the Spirit earlier in the Bible that we've talked about that I mentioned earlier. But again, none of those other places use the same language, the same grammar that Paul uses here. And so what the Greek grammarians say is that while it's possible that this phrase means filled with the Spirit like a cup is filled with water, that that's actually unlikely. That what's likely here is that this means filled by the Spirit. It would be unusual Greek for this to mean filled with the Spirit like a cup is filled with water. This likely means be filled by the Spirit. In other words, the Spirit fills you with something. And that actually makes a lot of sense in Ephesians because Ephesians 1 starts by saying, you've been given the Spirit. You have the Spirit. So the issue here is not you getting the Spirit. There's something else going on. So I think what Paul is saying is that instead of filling yourself up with alcohol, let the Spirit fill you up. Now, if that is the correct meaning, then how does that fit into the book of Ephesians? Does Ephesians give us any clue about what the Spirit is going to fill you up with? And the answer is definitely yes. Look at Ephesians 1, 23. Ephesians 1, 23 says that the church is Christ's body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Okay, so I know that's hard to wrap our minds around, but Christ fills everything, Paul says. Then look at chapter 3, verse 19. When the Spirit strengthens you with his power in the inner man, chapter 3, verse 19 says, you will know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled up to or with all the fullness of God. Look at chapter 4, verse 10. He who descended is him is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might... Fill all things. Christ died and was buried and rose again and ascended back to heaven so that he might fill everything. And then look at chapter 4, verse 13. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and in the, the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As we grow up as a church, we grow up toward the fullness of Christ. And remember, Christ is supposed to fill everything. All right, that's all kind of abstract and maybe feels hard to understand, but I think it's really this simple. Paul is saying you need to be filled up with God and particularly you need to be filled up with Jesus. <coughs> filled up with the knowledge of Jesus, filled with an understanding of his will and what pleases him, filled up with his love for you, Filled up with his character, with Christ-likeness. Filled up with his love for other people. Your new life in Christ is supposed to fill you up 
soak your life, take over as the dominant influence in your life. What is a Christian supposed to be dominated by, influenced by, look like? Jesus, right? So what is the Spirit going to fill you up with? That's actually pretty simple, isn't it? He's going to fill you up with the fullness of Christ. He's going to fill you up with Jesus. The understanding of Jesus, the work of Jesus, the character of Jesus. So don't be drunk with wine. Don't let alcohol soak your life and become the dominant influence. Let the Spirit fill you up with the fullness of Jesus so that the new life takes over. So that Jesus is the dominant influence in your life. So that all those things in the first part of the sermon happen in your life. Okay, now let me ask this. Just What, what if the Greek grammarians are wrong? What if Ephesians 5.18 does mean that you're supposed to be filled up with the Spirit like a cup is filled up with water? Well, that doesn't change the meaning. Because again, Ephesians 1 tells us you've been given the Spirit. So if Paul is saying be filled with the Spirit in the sense of filled up like a cup, then what he means is be filled up with the work of the Spirit. All these things in Ephesians that we've seen are the work of the Spirit. Be filled up with all of that. Let the work of the Spirit take over your life. So if, if that is the right understanding, then I think that's the meaning and it's really almost identical. So what does be filled with the Spirit mean? It might mean be filled with the work of the Spirit. More likely it means be filled by the Spirit with all the fullness of God in Christ. Let's make that really practical for just a second. Do you know what it's like to see somebody whose life is really filled with the Spirit? Because you just get Jesus from them. What does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 2.14? The sweet aroma of the knowledge of Christ is manifest by us in every place. Do you know what it's like to talk to a drunk person and smell it on them? That's just the idea here. You know what it's like to be around a person who's so soaked with Jesus that you can just see it, you can smell it when you're around them. That's what he's talking about. Then we can ask the question, when does it happen? Well, the only clue that Ephesians 5.18 gives us is that the command is in the present tense, so that suggests something that's ongoing in our lives, and that's what we'd expect, right? After all we've talked about, that makes sense. This isn't like the temporary filling of the Spirit for those who needed to know how to weave the curtains in the tabernacle. It's not like that. It isn't like the Spirit filling Zacharias for a brief prophecy or filling Peter to speak before the Sanhedrin. I mean, those other things were important works of the Spirit, but they were momentary manifestations of the Spirit. What Paul's talking about here is that something something that you want going on in your life all the time as a believer. You want to be filled with the Spirit all the time. You want to be being filled with the Spirit all the time. And that's really what, what he's saying there with the present tense. And so... I just urge you not to see this as something that is on or off, yes or no. And that's why in the whole, all the previous part of the sermon this morning, I have not used the phrase, or if I did, it was accidental. (laughs) I intended to not use the phrase, if a person is filled with the Spirit. And instead I've used the phrase, when a person is filled with the Spirit. Partly I'm doing this because there has been a very popular teaching here in Southern California. um, And I... I have no intention of being critical here, okay? It, it's, it's Chuck Smith who promoted this. Some of you were saved under the ministry of Chuck Smith. He was a man who I believe lived with integrity and taught the Bible faithfully. So please do not take me as trying to be criti- critical of him. Um, but his teaching about the difference between um, the Spirit with you, the Spirit in you, and the Spirit upon you, three stages of the experience of the Holy Spirit, I understand why it made sense. It made it seem kind of clear and simple for believers, but it's not biblically defensible. And I believe it actually causes real confusion. It was very confusing for me this week to read his explanation and then try to fit that into what the scriptures teach. So the, the, and part of the problem is that that then taught, many people have been taught that there is a baptism of the spirit that you need as a one-time experience after salvation. And the reason why that can cause a lot of damage is, first of all, I don't believe that has New Testament weight. Second of all, it, it, it hooks into the desire we all have for 
a quick one-time experience that would rescue us from our sin problems. And so the idea that many people have gotten is that I'm struggling with sin. Ah, if I could just get that baptism of the Holy Spirit, my sin struggles would go away. And so it becomes this thing that's communicated to believers in general. If you're not doing very well spiritually, it's probably because you don't have the baptism of the Spirit yet after salvation. And so I just would urge you to, that I do not think that is the way the Bible explains this. I would say that when we talk about um, alcohol, we ask the question, how drunk is that person? We even measure, right? Police officers even measure your blood alcohol level. And that's the way we should think about the filling of the Spirit, not as a, which people in this room are filled with the Spirit, stand up, and the rest of you who aren't filled with the Spirit, stay seated. But how much are you filled with the Spirit? That is the way we should think about it. Be being filled with the Spirit. How much is the Spirit filling your heart and life with Jesus? How much is Jesus the influence that's driving your life today? Be filled with the Spirit more today than you were yesterday. That's the way we want to think of it. And finally then, how can you obey this command? This is one of those strange passive commands that we find all over the New Testament. It's passive. Be filled. You can't do it yourself. The Spirit has to do it. God has to do it. Yet it's a command given to us. Be filled. It's a command we're supposed to obey. And so, again, Christians are understandably attracted to the idea of spiritual secrets and shortcuts to spirituality. And, and that's part of the appeal to the idea that there's a one-time experience after salvation of the Spirit. But, but this filling by the Spirit is not like that because this is part of your daily relationship with God. It's not a shortcut to spiritual growth. The Spirit or let's say it this way, the Spirit is not a shortcut to spiritual growth. The Spirit is a helper who empowers and enables spiritual growth. So how do you obey this command? You know what I'm going to say already, right? Pray for it. We see that in Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 3. Pray for the filling of the, by the Spirit. Second of all, believe in it. We didn't look at Romans 6 this morning, but in Romans 6, Paul says, you have to reckon these things to be true that you have died with Christ, that you have new life in Christ, that you are no longer a slave to sin, that by the Spirit you can put to death the deeds of the flesh. Reckon that to be true, even when you don't feel like it's true. So pray for it. Believe in it. Thirdly, have a very active relationship with the body of Christ. Remember, when he says, be filled with the Spirit, the next thing he says is speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Paul can't imagine a Christian off on his own. And I think you could say it this way. If the Spirit lives in the body of Christ, if, that's, if this is the temple that he dwells in, then if you want the influence of the Spirit in your life, then come hang out in the body of Christ a lot. That's where the Spirit dwells. Fourthly, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. That's Colossians 3.16. It's the parallel to Ephesians 5. Of course, Ephesians 6 says the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. Number five, don't grieve the Spirit. We saw that in Ephesians 4.30. Don't reject his working when he's at work in your heart. And number six, flee other influences. And that brings us full circle back to Ephesians 5.18. Don't be drunk with wine. Don't be under the influence of anything else other than Jesus, filled up with Christ by the Spirit. Flee the other influences that can take over your heart and your life. You know, what a massive step of maturity it would be for a Christian young man to say, I have to do something about the video games <laughs> because it's no longer just an appropriate entertainment in an appropriate time in my life. It, I can't, I desire it all the time. That's all I want to do. And I'm not, I don't want to read my Bible. I want to play video games. I don't want to go serve other people because that takes away time. I want to play my video games. What a huge step of maturity for a Christian young man to say, this is a problem. I have got to flee those up, this other influence in my life so that I can be controlled by God 
and what he wants for my life. And it's not just for young people, right? For every one of us, what are the things that dominate your influence? What, what are the things that when you know, you know, I probably had to read my Bible, you're thinking, I don't want to read my Bible. What I really want to go do is that. That's, that's the influence that's really driving you. So the filling by the Spirit's not a shortcut to spirituality, but it is the path to amazing joy because by the Spirit, the new life of Christ will grow and will flourish in your life. Some of you are probably not gardeners at all. We don't have any time to garden. I'm not much of a gardener, but some of you are gardeners. And since it's the beginning of May, the heat hasn't really kicked in yet. Some of you have something in your garden that's just flourishing. It's beautiful and you love to see it. That's what happens when you're filled with the Spirit. It's like your new life in Christ just flourishes and you You're excited to come back to your creative purpose in the image of God. You're amazed that he called you. His love is overwhelming for you. You feel so rich because of your inheritance in Christ and the hope that you have. And man, it affects your real relationships. It works itself out in real life. So be filled by the Spirit with the fullness of God in Christ. And you will deeply understand your new life in Christ and you will find your new life springing into action in real life. Let's pray. Father, I pray for the first for the ongoing work of your word here. This is a lot to think through at once. And I pray that you might take the book of Ephesians and uh, use it in the hearts of this church family. And may some of these truths really come home in ways that stick. So may you give to us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ in the days ahead. Secondly, we just pray that we would be a church family filled with the Spirit. You are building us together as a dwelling of God with the Spirit. So help us to care about the unity as much as you do. Help us to see the Spirit work out in our real relationships as you've called us to. Help us to own our calling. So Lord, we just take all this and we just bring it to you and we say, help, help. It's a command to us, yet it's, you have to do it. So help us. I, I pray that we'd be a, a church filled by your Spirit with all the fullness of God in Christ. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen.